World Tale. Today I have a very awesome guest with me, John D. Walt. He is probably the best, if definitely the best horn engraver around. And he's going to do a little demonstration on how to do it. So I'm using a Coulter engraver made by Coulter Precision Machinery. And it's it's basically a round stylus that's very sharp at the point. Um, it, it gives you good control on circulars and on, on, a, on a rounded surface and when doing uh, circular and detail. But most of the original works were not done with a stylus on, on a cow horn. A stylus and a, and a sailor's needle was used very extensively for nautical engraving on ivory for doing what they called scrimshaw. Today's engravers that work with horn like to call themselves an engraver because of the tools that they use are different than the tools that were used by the sailors on the ships to an extent. When you use a stylus, you're tearing the fibers of the horn, you're not cutting them, which in our lifetime might not make a difference, but it would cause more delamination than using a knife. So I'm putting a scallop around the bottom of this bracelet in the Tanzel style, which is sometimes very, very ornate, depending on which brother did the engraving. One of the things to remember when you engrave is not to work outside of the, the comfort zone of your hand. You can see here as I make these little circles on the top, that I start at the top and I come to the right, and then I start at the top and come to the left. This allows you more control because your hand doesn't like to move in a circle with the joints the way, it, the way they're, they're set in your hand. A lot of people call this tedious work. I, I call it therapy. So now was that, now was that freehanded or did you use um, graph paper? Or? I, I'm a reference artist. I, I draw a lot of my inspiration from things that I have seen. So I engrave original pieces in an 18th century style, uh, but I freehand draw everything onto the horn before I work it. Uh, if I'm doing a family crest or reproducing a specifically historic horn as a bench copy, I may use uh, uh, carbon paper to transfer an image onto the horn so it's exactly the way that they would want it to be. But I prefer to do freehand and original work. Now, do you use a normal style pencil to draw it or what do you do to mark the design so when i draw on the horn i actually use a very very small pencil uh, this is a 0.3 lead pencil so it's a very very tiny piece of lead uh, 0.3 is is below average 0.7 is what they normally sell 0.5 is a step below that and 0.3 is a step below that but allows you to make these really tiny lines here that you can see in the dragonfly wings and I guess the beauty of doing freehand is also that if your hands happen to rub it off, you drew it, you can draw it again. Once I get a little section here, I'll show you how we apply the ink. And it doesn't matter whether you're using a knife or a stylus, the, the same... Uh, action happens when you apply the ink it's called a capillary effect because you're actually engraving if you will a cut into the horn that the ink will automatically flow into the type of inks i use are uh, calligrapher inks or drawing inks some are pigmented and some are just as black as they are in the bottle so i use my, my favorite to use is a higgins india ink for the black and then this is, uh, uh, I believe this is uh, Liquitex uh, pigmented inks. They have a really nice color to them. And 
once they're dried, because they're water-based, not alcohol-based, once they're dried, you can actually add orange oil and beeswax to them, and it, it kind of creates a latex paint on the surface. So a lot of times when you're doing polychrome work, which is color work, is you know you, you want it to be color fast and waterproof. So adding that orange oil and beeswax to it seals it, creates a latex paint, which bonds better to the horn, and it makes it waterproof. So I'll grab a small brush here. I'll apply a little bit of ink to show the capillary effect. And I'm using a, uh, a 20 aught brush. Or I'm sorry, this is a single aught. I'm using a, a, a 20 single aught brush. You can see, I just, I just got the tip of the bristles wet, but when I apply it to what I engraved, it, it draws it right in. Okay, so it just follows the lines. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't need to, in the sense of uh, doing engraving on ivory, you don't need to, to apply it and wipe it off and apply it and wipe it off. This is more of a, a direct application, so there, there's less work when you're done, because once you've applied the ink, then you have to take away the excess I use a uh, four aught steel wool to do that and it takes and smooths out the rough edges from using the the stylus and even when you have single lines the same thing will happen I don't know if you're able to see that but it draws it right into it and when it stops drawing ink into lines, you just add a little more ink to your brush. I actually did my master's thesis for the Honorable Company of Horners on the differences between engraving and scrimshaw um, th there's there's not a whole lot of difference but the historical aspects of it go back a lot further than people would expect inuit uh, inuit eskimos from over 3000 years ago were doing a rudimentary form of scrimshaw if you will on uh, rib bones of whales walrus tusks things of those natures. In the Inuit Museum in Alaska, there's examples of engravings that are over 3,000 years old. So this is not a new craft. This is very, very old in its origins. When's the first evidence of engraving on horns? Well, uh, I mean, that it's, it's hard to tell. Um, it, it, there's no specific historical reference for it, but... England was doing engraving on uh, cow horn, but their cow horns were more refined in the sense that they had artisans that were doing them. So it was more of a flax, not, not a rudimentary powder horn like we saw here in the Americas. Um, so the, the carving and engraving in England goes all the way back to 1300s that, that I have found. There's, there's probably some older than that. The incursion into the Americas prior to the French and Indian War, uh, Cortez brought cattle to the coast. You know, um, those, those cattle proliferated. They lived and they expanded. And uh, when, when Jesuits were coming here, they were also bringing uh, cattle and goats and anything that had bovine horn on it. So the, the readily available flasks and, and products that were done in England weren't necessarily available here in the Americas initially so the next available source was cow horn and it became you know it became the the next medium if you will for 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 the uh, art style uh, the cow horn in itself is naturally shaped to the body it's impervious to water and when made correctly both with the tip and the base it keeps your powder dry so that it can fuel the musket to win the war if you will um, 
rudimentary styles of engraving were found all over the Americas, but there's there's some fine examples, you know, in the golden age of powder horns from post-revolutionary war all the way, or, or uh, post-French and Indian war all the way through revolutionary war and war of 1812, where there was schools of horn work. Um, John Bush did a lot of map horns. Uh, he, he also made the Williams Williams horn, which I did a bench copy of for the NMLRA. Uh, they were very exquisite, but it's common to find a lot of misspellings and, and uh, uh, rudimentary drawings, such as this deer here, even even War of 1812 and beyond. Th this is what they call a tansel style of a deer. It seems rudimentary, but it's it's very correct in its in its musculature. It's very correct in its in the in the flow of the legs and the, you know you can tell it's a deer or prior to this you know it might have uh, been more of a fantasy animal like the hell horse that you find on some horns you know it looks like a dragon but it's not it looks like a horse but it's not you know. but any any medium uh that will accept an engraver has been tried uh, there's there's various types of tools. So this this is the Coulter engraver here. And again, we we discussed that it's a tool steel tip that's sharpened on a diamond wheel, so it's very sharp. This is actually a sailor's needle that's embedded into a wooden handle. And these are different size sailor's needles here. This is a copy of the knife that John Proud uses, which it would be more historically correct and this this is nice in the sense that you can both do uh, straight line engraving you can do curved edge engraving and you can also chip carve with this because it is a knife uh, then this is a number seven surgical blade which is stiffer than a normal exacto blade but it get, it allows you to make uh, straight lines and cut lines to broaden your lines an example of that and so you make a single line this way. I don't know if you can see that. But this is cut at an angle going from my right to my left. And then I turn it around. And now I score the top and the bottom. And now I can cut from the right to the left again. But now it's making a broad line. And this, this takes longer because of its uh, the intricate style of the cut. But now you can see this piece of horn is peeling away, leaving a broader line underneath. And I'll just go back and dress the other side so it's nice and clean. And that you don't really realize how broad that is until you apply the ink. So we'll put a stylus line next to it there. And I'll do a knife cut here. Let's use the uh, other X-Acto knife. And you'll see the difference in the lines here. that dry for a second and then I'll wipe it off and you'll see the difference in the lines. I started doing this when I was 12 years old and I just kind of stuck. I haven't been able to get away from it ever since but it's a lot, a lot of years of engraving but I'm very pleased with you know the things that I'm able to do with it. The double cut line you can see how wide that is this is a stylus line which is still pretty thick but thinner than this and this is a knife cut line which is the thinnest line 
So this design shows you three different aspects all in one. So the, these are knife cut lines, you know, making them broader. These are stylus lines here, and these are knife cut lines to make the outline of the cross hatching. This was also done by a knife. You can see how nice and dainty that is. So it depends on what you're working on and what you're trying to achieve as to what tool you're going to use. There's also a method called stippling, which uh, I use this as a stippling tool. I can show you what that looks like. This is actually an experiment that I was doing. So this is cross hatching using two different styles. This is stippling done with this tool and you can go, the more dots you put into the horn, the, the darker it's going to be and the less dots and the further apart, the lighter it will be. But the easy process of doing this, we'll do it right next to the stipple, is just plunge it in and out. And this tool is essentially just an awl that you have sharpened. This was uh, made by Billy Griner. I'm not sure what he used to make it, but yeah, but technically it isn't, it, it's like an awl. It, it reacts like an awl. So a hard piece of steel that's been, been sharpened to down to a point, yeah. Now we'll do some a little further apart here to kind of add shading. And let's throw some ink on that and you'll see what that looks like. If you can see that, but the closer the lines are together, the closer the dots are together, the darker it looks and the further apart. So yeah, it's darker in the one corner and then lighter in the mm -hmm. upper part. And there, I know people that this is all they do for their style of scrimshaw. It takes a very, very long time, but you can achieve photorealistic results by doing it. Wow. Yeah. And that's, that's the basics. Um, I, I, I mean, again, you never work out of your comfort zone. You, know, you always try to find a comfortable place to, to put the horn as you're working. I mean, there'll be a lot of times, and that's, that's why drawing it out is nice, that as, as I'm cutting, it might not be comfortable to make the D this way, so I'll turn it upside down and I'll draw my knife this way. You know, it, just, it just depends on your comfort zone. And when you're doing the, the tiny little aspects, you don't use as much pressure. And you can always retrace a line. Now the bags you're placing it on, are they shot bags or? Nope, these are filled with rice. Okay. I, I've used a lot of different types of bags over the years. And I found that the that sand compacts quite nicely, but it, sometimes it's a it's a little too hard for what I'm trying to do. The rice still gives a little bit, but it still holds its shape and form when I press something into it. And you can press this eraser in there, and it's just it's not going to move. And then that's a tiny little dragonfly. So this is a Philadelphia horn. Philadelphia screw tip. Uh, the, the naming characteristics of that is from, we'll take this out so you can see, the actual screw tip. The shape of it represents the pawn of a chess set. It has a defined collar that's larger than a tip. And the base plug in its profile looks like the shape of a bell. I've seen them with or without bands. This would be what's called an early Philadelphia because it has the, the wasp waist, the uh, 
uh, rope carving or, uh, up toward the center of the base. This is a pewter band and the rest of it's made from horn. It's engraved with the 1778 Pennsylvania crest. And then it has the skyline of Philadelphia at the base, which has a windmill here, ships, docks, houses, churches, and usually somewhere in the originals on one of the church spires, there was this little rooster. <laughs> and then I put text up here that says, let not victory be our only guide, but may God be our only compass. And this was not a custom order, so I left space for the, to add in anything that the the buyer would want to purchase now that horn was treated with aquafortis ferric nitrate okay. actually aquafortis is a is pretty much ferric nitrate but it's a, a more inert form of it ferric nitrate is nitric acid with uh, iron or ferrous metal dissolved into it until the nitric acid no longer will dissolve the metal and then it's applied to the horn it's allowed to sit uh, I usually leave mine sit anywhere between 6 and 12 hours, and then heat is applied, and this is the color that comes out. Now, how will that affect the coloring of the engraving? Uh, it will dull it down some. You can see here the red is much darker than when it was applied. And if you engrave afterwards, how does that... Uh, there, if you engrave afterwards, there's the possibility that you may uh, end up scraping off some of your coloration because the coloration, a chemical dye will penetrate further than a natural dye will. Uh, a lot of horn makers use Brit dye to color their horns, and there's nothing wrong with that. It holds up very well, but it doesn't penetrate as much. Uh, there are several horn makers that, that apply ferric nitrate to their horns and engrave them after, but they're not necessarily doing polychrome work. Uh, most of the polychrome work is done prior prior to that treatment because the more that you have to relieve the lines that you cut the possibility of lightening the the dye that you've done is going to happen it, it can if you're using steel wool you could steel wool it off basically yeah you could scrape this horn down and make it white again do you apply any wax or yep. finish? so so when i use ferric nitrate when i get the coloration i want I use a baking soda wash to okay. make sure that there's no, uh, no, no acids left on the horn. And once that's done, uh, I wash it down uh, with alcohol and I apply, I, I like to use Minwax Paste Finishing Wax. Uh, it adds a nice protective surface. It's also has a, a Renaissance wax is also a very nice wax to use. And uh, Howard's uh, Furniture Wax is also a good wax to use. The main thing to remember is even though the horn is pretty much impervious to weather, the more you take this out in the weather, the more the engraving will suffer. So it's it's important to remember to, to treat the engraving, not necessarily the horn. You want to apply a coat of wax on it at least once a year if you use it on a regular basis. And that that, that said, all, the entire thing, the, the wood, the horn, I mean, the tip, everything, that you, you, you should try to protect it. This is a this is a miniature Philadelphia. It still has the skyline of Philadelphia here, but in a miniature scale. This has a horn band instead of a pewter band. There's a cannonade here and to put the owner's name in. And then there's the Great Britain cipher up here, the GR. So this would be probably King George II, but I did not add a number in there, depending upon the buyer, what they would want to do. On the other side... I added a scroll for them to put their name in. This is also treated with the ferric nitrate. And then the tip is dyed with a uh, uh, writ dye to make it dark. But this has all the same characteristics. Even though it's a very, very small Philadelphia, the tip looks like a, a pawn from a chess set and the base has the shape of a bell. The next one we have here is a fourth generation York County screw tip horn. This one's actually very large. It's somewhere between 17 and a half and 18 inches in length. The characteristics of a York County, it has what they would call a beehive, but in, in uh, smaller radiuses as it goes toward the tip. It is an external screw tip, meaning it's external into the tip. And the tip on a York 
acts as a funnel to fill the horn. The other characteristics of a York horn, the main characteristics, are the two incise lines that throw that go all the way around the horn, and then there's two incise lines at the base that go all the way around the horn. And then the, the base plug of the York County fourth generation is very ornate, has a Roman key, a band of Roman key carving, a band of rope carving, and then a really, really nicely turned base to it. I just love the flow of this base. And this horn was treated with writ dye it's in several layers. Uh, I've, used, I've used yellow, uh, green, brown, and black to get the coloration on this horn. The coloration on this tip, the black is natural. Where you see the green, it was amber colored. This is a uh, um, northern Berks County spotted horn. This has a very dainty tip to it with a very, very tiny wasp waist at the base of the tip. It has pretty much a straight collar. The tip also acts as a funnel to fill the horn. And then the base of the horn has a rather large bead, a wasp waist, both here and here. And then it's an integral horn finial at the tip. This horn was treated with uh, red lead oxide to make the dots on it and then with ferric nitrate to give the yellow color. So red lead oxide, what? Red, red lead oxide, I, I'm not a chemist, but red lead oxide is uh, basically a lead oxide. It, it's reddish in color and when mixed with lye water it creates a chemical reaction that uh, burns the surface of the horn. Okay. So that's a chemical that you can purchase. Yes. Through... It, you would have to, you would have to have lye and just mix it with water. Um, and, and then, uh, the red lead oxide is a powder that there are several sources that you can purchase from. Okay. <laughs>